thank you all um, going to get started here. It is 11 o'clock. Uh, welcome to the latest presentation in the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers webinar series. I'm Mike Holcomb, Associate Director for Information Technology for the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center and the Arizona Telemedicine Program. These webinars are designed to provide timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth programs. These webinars are typically presented on the third Thursday of each month. Next slide, please. Located throughout the country, there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers and two national telehealth resource centers funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration. Each serve as focal points for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. Next slide, please. A few tips before we get started. Your audio has been muted. Please use the Q&A function of the Zoom platform to ask questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, and if time doesn't allow, uh, they'll be addressed uh, in writing uh, back to the registrants uh, following the presentation. Please note that the closed captioning, or that rather that closed captioning is available and located at the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to access today's and past webinars on the NCTRC YouTube channel. Today's webinar is hosted by the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center. It is my pleasure to introduce today's webinar, Ransomware in Health, and your presenters, Gene Varner Powell and David Shelley. Uh, beginning with Gene, Gene E. Varner Powell, JD, Senior, Lisk, Senior Legal Risk Management Consultant uh, for Mike or MICA, or for MICA rather. As a medical malpractice defense attorney, Jean represented hospitals and healthcare professionals for nearly 20 years. In 2020, she left litigation to join MICA as the senior legal risk management consultant. In this position, she writes and speaks on medical professional liability topics and consults directly with insured physicians and practices. Jean, please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks, Michael. Ransomware in healthcare can no longer be considered just a tech issue. There's been a significant increase in the severity, the frequency, and the scope of these types of attacks. And as a result, ransomware attacks and other cyber incidents are now creating significant patient safety issues. A case in point that you all may have seen recently in the last few weeks in the news headlines involves um, a hospital in Alabama. And that hospital suffered a ransomware attack a couple of years ago. And there's now been a lawsuit filed by a patient who came there during the ransomware attack to deliver her baby. And the lawsuit alleges that healthcare providers that were taking care of her were unable to access fetal monitoring equipment that was necessary to ensure the safe delivery of the baby without injury. And so the, the lawsuit alleges that as a result, the baby was delivered with complications, with injuries, and eventually died. So I'm sure it's no uh, surprise to you when I say that the healthcare setting is really the perfect extortion opportunity for cyber criminals because of the high stakes involved. If computer systems are disabled, hospitals and medical practices can't provide patient care. Patient data is also a valuable commodity and it's estimated to be worth 10 to 20 times the value of credit card data on the dark web. Historically, healthcare organizations are easy targets with many weaknesses that make them vulnerable. And compared to businesses in other industries, statistics show that healthcare organizations are less likely to have backups available, less successful at discovering and stopping malware attacks before data is encrypted, and more likely to pay ransom. Healthcare organizations have a number of challenges which make them vulnerable including many are using outdated systems that can no longer incorporate the, late, the latest security updates. 
they have limited information technology budgets and they devote more money to speed and information sharing than to data security. Staff are often under train on cybersecurity measures. And there was a spike in remote access during the pandemic. And remote access is now one of the more frequent entry points for ransomware attacks. Next slide, please. A cyber attack can cripple a medical practice overnight or a hospital and make it by making it unable to provide patient care. The sudden interruption leaves healthcare professionals vulnerable to medical malpractice claims that arise out of cyber incidents, i.e. that Alabama case I just talked about. Lack of access to the medical record can lead to diagnostic errors, medication errors, delays in treatment. I also want to emphasize that even though we hear about attacks on hospitals in the news, in fact, medical practices and smaller healthcare providers are increasingly likely targets for healthcare data breaches. HC3, which is the cybersecurity arm of the Department of Health and Human Services, reports that in the first part of this year, ransomware criminals targeted medical practices far more often than hospitals. And in Arizona, where I am, there's actually several small practices that have suffered devastating attacks. Data breaches are also on the rise. 72% of the ransomware attack of the ransomware incidents tracked by HC3 this year have involved data leaks. And in 2020, ransomware was responsible for about 50% of all healthcare data breaches. Data breaches can result in the erosion of patient trust. So you have patients actually leaving your practice. There can be significant damage to your organization's reputation, especially in the form of negative online reviews. Data breaches can also lead to government compliance investigations, which can result in penalties and privacy lawsuits by patients uh, whose data was compromised. As far as the cost to recover from a ransomware attack, one recent survey of a small to mid-sized healthcare entities put the price tag at 1.27 million. Costs can include individual breach notification letters to patients, an IT forensic investigation, data restoration, rebuilding your computer system if hardware or software is impacted, hiring a PR firm to mitigate reputational damage, hiring a law firm, to advise on compliance with HIPAA and state data security laws and to assess breach reporting obligations. Legal defense costs, lawsuit settlement costs, the price of credit monitoring that a practice may offer its patients. Lost income is significant due to business interruption and having to cancel patient appointments while you can't access the EHR. Uh, regulatory fines and penalties that may arise out of a HIPAA compliance investigation. Next slide, please. The next few slides focus on the HIPAA security rule. And in the interest of time, I'm going to go pretty quickly through those just to give you an overview of its significance. On the resources page at the very end of the slide deck, I've included some links for more information on the security rule. Healthcare organizations have been required since 2005 to comply with the HIPAA security rule by implementing safeguards to protect the confidentiality and integrity of all of the electronic protected health information they maintain. And that's not just information in the patient's electronic health record. It also requires healthcare professionals to ensure that only those individuals who should have access to EPHI do have access. Next slide, please. The security rule requires entities to perform a comprehensive risk analysis and to have a written policy and procedure in place that guides this analysis. During audits in 2016 and 17, the Office of Civil Rights, which is OCR, the government agency that enforces HIPAA, found that only 14% of healthcare entities are in substantial compliance with the risk analysis requirements. When conducting a risk analysis, you need to identify all your PHI, determine and analyze the risks to the confidentiality and integrity of that EPHI. 
You need to document the analysis and retain copies of the documentation. HHS does have a good security risk analysis tool, and I have a link to that on the resources page. After you conduct a risk analysis, uh, then you need to implement security measures to reduce each risk to a reasonable and appropriate level. You need written procedures in place to prevent, detect, contain, and correct security violations, i.e. cyber attacks. And you need policies and procedures in place to guide your risk management activities. And finally, you need to document, again, each phase of the process and retain the documentation in case of a regulatory investigation. During audits, OCR found that 94% of entities failed to implement safeguards to reduce the identified risks to a reasonable and appropriate level. Next slide, please. OCR does periodically audit healthcare entities for compliance and it investigates an organization anytime a data breach is reported. I'll take this opportunity to recommend to you that if you and your organization are not currently in compliance with the security rule that you immediately take steps to get into compliance. It's one of the most effective risk management strategies that you can implement to address the threat of a ransomware attack. Compliance not only helps you avoid regulatory fines and penalties, but it also greatly reduces the risk of a cyber attack. So given the varied and costly ramifications of a ransomware attack that I just mentioned, it's money and time well spent to comply with the security rule. Next slide, please. Let's talk about what the security rule requires if a healthcare organization suffers a ransomware or other malware attack. First of all, before an attack ever occurs, and hopefully for your organization it never does, the security rule requires you to prepare ahead of time by developing written, reasonable, and appropriate security incident procedures and response processes to address ransomware incidents. In other words, you need a comprehensive written plan in place that you've tested ahead of time. Very important, test your plan ahead of time that will allow you to address and recover from a ransomware attack. Under HIPAA, a security incident is defined as the attempted or successful unauthorized access, use, disclosure, modification, or destruction of information or interference with the operations of an information system. According to OCR, the presence of ransomware or other malware on an entity's computer is a security incident under the security rule. And at the time the, the entity discovers this incident, it must initiate its security incident response procedures. Your plan needs to have procedures in place to identify and respond to the incident and to mitigate as much as possible the potential harm. This will include things like determining incident scope, where it originated, whether it's ongoing or finished and how it occurred and then responding to contain the impact, identify and correct vulnerabilities that permitted the attack, restore lost da data, and to allow return to business as usual. And you also need to conduct post-incident activities. So you're required to document security incidents, the outcome, and all of these steps you take along the way in response to the incident. And you need to, again, retain the documentation in case of a later regulatory investigation. In addition, the security rule requires that a healthcare entity have a written contingency plan in place that it will implement in the event of a security incident. And you need to have a data backup, disaster recovery and emergency mode operation plans as part of this requirement. Finally, OCR's published guidance does recommend reporting ransomware attacks to the FBI and other law enforcement agency. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk about breach. In healthcare, ransomware attacks and data breaches do now go hand in hand. Healthcare is now the most targeted sector for, for data breaches. And according to HHS, ransomware attacks were responsible for almost 50% of all healthcare data breaches in 2020. And in 48 US healthcare ransomware 
incidents tracked by HHS during the first half of 2021, 72% involved data leaks. Under HIPAA, breach is defined as the acquisition, access, use, or disclosure of PHI in a manner not permitted under the HIPAA privacy rule, which compromises security or privacy of PHI. As part of your response to a security incident, you must undertake an assessment of whether a breach occurred. Please note that you're required to document and retain all information considered during the assessment of the cyber attack. And in particular, if you decide no breach occurred, you need to document how you reached that conclusion. It's extremely important to know that in the event of a ransomware attack involving unencrypted data, OCR presumes a breach. You can re rebut that presumption um, and we'll cover that next. But before we go there, I'd like to outline what HIPAA requires in terms of breach reporting requirements. So in the case of a breach of protected health information, a healthcare entity must notify each individual breach victim within 60 days of the discovery of the breach. If the breach affects 500 or more people, the entity must report the breach to OCR and the media as soon as possible, but no later than 60 days after the discovery. If the breach affects fewer than 500 people, then no media notification is necessary, but you must report it to OCR within 60 days after the end of the calendar year in which the breach occurred. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pass over the state data breach discussion. Suffice it to say, each state uh, has and more and more states are implementing their own uh, data breach and privacy uh, laws. And some states have more stringent laws that actually put uh, further obligations on top of healthcare providers and other businesses above what HIPAA requires. And so it's important if you have a data breach situation to work with your legal team to be aware of what the state data breach laws may require so that you can stay in compliance with those. Next slide, please. So I hope you never have to send breach notification letters to patients, but if you do, please remember that HIPAA dictates the content of these letters. And actually during audits, OCR finds that most breach notification letters don't contain all the required information. So let's quickly run through what you must include. The letter needs to be written in plain language, provide a brief description of the breach, including dates of breach and the breach discovery date if known, describe the types of information involved, list the steps that affected individuals should take to protect themselves from potential harm, Describe what you are doing to investigate the breach, mitigate harm, and prevent further breaches. Include contact information for your practice or organization so people can ask questions. This may be a toll-free number, an email address, or a postal address, or even a website. You need to send the letter by first-class mail, and you need to send, again, the letter within 60 days of discovery of the breach. And if you have contact information for 10 or more patients that's out of date or insufficient, then you have to provide a substitute form of notice. You can do that by posting a notice on the homepage of your website for at least 90 days, or you could post notice in a major print or broadcast media in the area where most of your patients reside. Next slide, please. As I said, you can re rebut the presumption of breach this is not a task that a medical practice would undertake on its own. It is a task to be delegated to an IT forensics team and a legal team. To rebut the presumption, you have to show a low probability that the PHI was compromised considering various factors. And in addition, in the situation where the data is encrypted and remains encrypted at all times, there is no breach but that is a technical determination as well, again, that you need to delegate to your technical and legal experts working on your behalf. Next slide. As part of rebutting the breach presumption, it's crucial to conduct an assessment and investigation of the attack in a way that preserves technical, technical forensic evidence that you may be able to use 
to help you in your rebuttal. Uh, you need the evidence to support a determination that no breach occurred. You want to show that no breach occurred because then you won't have breach notification obligations and this can sa save you significant time, money and can preserve trust and goodwill with patients. Again, for this um, investigation, you'll rely on your technical and legal teams and you need to get these teams in place right away. To do that, I recommend checking your cyber liability insurance policy for instructions on reporting ransomware and other malware attacks. Once you report a claim, your cyber carrier may assist with selecting an attorney that's experienced in HIPAA investigations and an IT company that specializes in ransomware remediation and forensic analysis. You should also consider reporting ransomware attacks to your medical professional liability insurance carrier, especially since in these more, in, in attacks, we are more and more seeing uh, potentially medical negligence type of claims versus data privacy types of claims. And so potentially your medical professional liability policy may come into play for coverage versus your cyber insurance policy. Next slide, please. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this list of forensic do's and don'ts, but it is a great list of considerations. And hopefully the message it sends is that you don't want to forge ahead on your own in terms of system recovery activities. Get a technical and legal team in place that are experienced in ransomware to direct the activities in order to preserve the forensic evidence. Next slide, please. I just want to cover briefly lawsuits and allegations that we're seeing lately um, arising out of ransomware attacks. In data breaches involving large health systems, for instance, Banner a few years ago, or this year, the Scripps incident, we're seeing class action lawsuits being filed. Most of these are alleging various state law claims, including violations of state privacy laws, negligence, breach of contract, breach of fiduciary duty. Some of these are being dismissed by judges on the basis that the damages or injuries claimed are too speculative or not legally compensable. For instance, a case uh, involving Envision Healthcare in Nevada, the plaintiff claimed that she suffered lost time, spent reviewing consumer credit reports, obtaining new credit cards, checking financial accounts, and answering an increased number of spam calls. She also alleged stress from dealing with the effects of the uh, breach uh, and worry and anxiety about applying for new credit cards. Also concerned that damage to her credit worthiness could impact her future ability to obtain credit. The trial court did dismiss the case. The dismissal was appealed and it eventually reached the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which affirmed the dismissal on the basis that the plaintiff failed to allege legally compensable damages. The court held that lost time was not compensable and there was no indication that her personal information had actually lost value or been stolen. And that is that is kind of the basis of the dismissal of many of these claims is that there's no information the the personal information has actually lost value or been stolen. And so the, claim, the damages claimed are too speculative. In a federal lawsuit, which arises from a 2020 ransomware attack on universal health services in Pennsylvania. The judge dismissed two claims alleging the attack put them at uh, the plaintiffs at greater risk for identity theft. Uh, however, the judge did allow a third plaintiff to go forward with his claims. And interestingly, that plaintiff said that the IT system's downtime caused a delay in a surgery he needed. And because of his delayed surgery, he alleges, he continued to miss work and then as a result, he lost his employer provided health insurance, which forced him to purchase a higher cost insurance. So we'll follow and see where that case goes. Here's another lawsuit scenario that I thought was interesting. Tech company Electa, uh, it provides cloud data storage solutions to cancer treatment facilities. And Electa suffered a ransomware attack, which forced it to take its software offline for a period of time. And plaintiffs have filed a class action lawsuit alleging that this downtime prevented or delayed treatment for many cancer patients 
nationwide. And so they've actually you know, added in the cancer treatment centers. And then finally, after um, um, a ransomware attack in Alabama, that's the one I think I talked about with the patient who recently filed a wrongful death claim arising out of the loss of her baby, but there are other patients filing lawsuits claiming they were forced to forego medical care and treatment or had to seek alternative care because that hospital could not access its medical records. Next slide, please. So some risk reduction strategies in closing, I'd like to stress that you should strongly consider cyber liability insurance with adequate limits to cover the costs that you may incur as a result of a ransomware attack. Use the HIPAA security rule compliance to manage cyber liability risk and to avoid regulatory fines, penalties, and corrective action plans, and carefully vet and select a reputable IT vendor if you're going to outsource your IT work. I've talked to physicians who thought that their tech vendor had everything covered. They thought they had backups in place that would be usable and not subject to ransomware infection that were stored securely offline if they uh, suffered an attack. And then when they did, uh, their backups were not available for them. You should be checking with your vendor periodically for evidence that they're doing all you assume they're doing. Um, arrange for cybersecurity awareness and response training for all physicians, practice staff, and any employees in your organization. Again, your cyber and L MPL carriers may be able to suggest some resources in this area. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, excellent presentation. It's clearly important for healthcare providers and their business associates to utilize uh, well-qualified professionals in their cybersecurity programs. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Shelley, president of BVA Incorporated. David grew up in Washington, DC and has been living in Arizona since 2004. He loves helping organizations stay current on cutting edge technology that is reliable, secure, and current. A very transparent individual, fair but stern. Because of his talented staff, it allows him to be a very talented, driven, and competent technology advocate and leader. David has a strong background in project management, technical delivery, and customer relations. Please take it away, David. Oh, you're muted, David. Uh, still not hearing you. We heard you at the beginning of the call, but can't hear you now. Possibly leave computer audio and rejoin it in the, the little uh, menu that you can access next to the microphone in Zoom in the video window there. There's a leave computer audio setting and then click that again to, to join it again. No. Maybe unplug and replug your headset. Uh, bear with us, everyone. There is another option. If you have a phone available, David, if you go to that same menu where you did the leave computer audio, if you click switch to phone audio, then it will give you a number to call and, and uh, give you the instructions to connect and it will associate the audio with your video window. Still not hearing you. Thanks for your patience, everyone, as we work through uh, technical glitch.
How about now? Can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Thank you. Okay, very good. So thanks for the time today. Thank you, Zoom, for messing up uh, my audio. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, uh, what we're going to focus on today is uh, some deliverables that, that we've been doing in the, with healthcare organizations here in town, uh, addressing cybercrime incidences, as well as securing their networks associated to ransomware. Um, and that's what, that's what we do. That's what I do in specific is we manage a few healthcare organizations as well, uh, their IT, as well as come in and do forensics on where their vulnerabilities are within the system and how can we cover those gaps. Uh, so today, what, what I'm going to talk about, because this is a, a rabbit hole of a subject matter technically of, of all the different areas that need to be addressed. What I'll focus on today is just some key deliverables that we're going into and seeing that organizations aren't addressing. Uh, and, and these are clear things that your internal IT staff can address and implement and uh, address ransomware getting into your environment, try to close that that gap, so to speak. So the one thing that we tend to see in organizations are um, have multiple directories. So we recommend having a single directory structure that is administrating all the devices. All the devices are connect to it, connected to it. And for the most part, every single device has two-factor authentication set up. There's a lot of products out there that will facilitate this. But every time a device logs into an application, uh, a directory structure, there should be some form of two-factor associated. Um, and again, there's a lot of products out there that can facilitate that. It's just a matter of um, addressing it and deploying it system-wide. And the, our mindset when it comes to security is uh, building security in layers. So if your IT folks or if a consultant comes in and says, there's this one product that will facilitate what you need in terms of filling all these holes, they're lying to you, or they're just not knowledgeable in this area, and they're kind of outside of their depth. There is not a silver bullet. There's not one single product uh, that will address vulnerabilities in your system and to address ransomware. You have to build your security in different layers in the event of one of them failing. Uh, because hackers are smarter than your IT folks and hackers are smarter than me. I mean, it, 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 they are constantly moving the needle and I'm constantly catching up. So that being said, having a single directory in place where all your devices are, are authenticating is crucial. Another subject matter is user accounts. There is a lot of user accounts that the password policy just isn't sufficient enough. There's still six to eight character and they really need to be 12. And you're gonna to start to see a lot of compliance come down here uh, where they're gonna force 12. And as you can see in the slide, uppercase, lowercase, a number, a symbol, um, and not using reused passwords. These are all things that are typical in the password policy. And what I see in healthcare organization is typically eight. And they have to change their password every six months which is not HIPAA compliant, but this is a huge component. This is how most, this is how most breaches happen is off old passwords, uh, old directory accounts that are disabled or enabled, but they're not leveraged anymore. No one's logged into it for six months to a year. So looking at your directory structure, deleting old active directory accounts, making sure that that's very clean. That's a huge step in this process of, of securing your network. Next slide, please. Two-factor authentication, I talked about it a little bit, and I guarantee everyone on the call knows what that means, uh, so I won't get into that, but for the most part, every email platform, most healthcare organizations have moved to a cloud-based structure. I still see some internal mail systems, but most of them are with, with Office 365 or, or, or Gmail now, um, so two-factor at an email layer is very, very, very important because most cyber crimes, most uh, ransomware attacks come in through email. They really do. Someone comes in with an email, they click it, you're done. And that's how quick it can happen is a single click, as many of you know. So 
two-factor on email to ensure that um, email accounts aren't getting breached and you're not getting an email saying, hey, you need to reset your password. Uh, if that happened, obviously two-factor would catch that. All production devices should have two-factor. We talked about laptops, desktops, tablets that roam around on the floors. Typically those aren't two-factor. I see that, that's a common theme. All the tablets that go into patient rooms, they are not two-factor. I've only seen that probably in three healthcare organizations I've walked into. All the rest don't have it to that layer. That's extremely important, obviously. Um, those tablets are very susceptible to breach. Um, most tablets, my guys can hack in less than 10 minutes if they're on the Wi-Fi or the Bluetooth is on. And so tablets aren't really meant, especially the tablets that are used in healthcare, aren't really meant to be extremely secure. They're not built for that. Um, all remote desktop sessions, most, most medical applications that organizations leverage are published and a published app. Um, through RDS, Remote Desktop, which is a Microsoft product, or Citrix. That's how a lot of breaches have happened in the last year, and they've gotten newsworthy media attention uh, from published application uh, that had no two-factor setup, uh, as well as no VPN. So there should be a VPN if you're leveraging a published app for your, your healthcare platform, as well as a two-factor that goes to your mobile device. Also, all applications leverage, any collaboration tool like a SharePoint, any EMR, EHR, Box, Dropbox, those should also be set up for two-factor if it's a client base or even a web base. Uh, these are things that just typically get overlooked because, you know, Box or Dropbox, people use it just to share information and they don't realize how, because it's convenient, they don't realize how insecure it is and how easy it is to, to, to hack. Um, Someone mentioned, uh, another IT person mentioned to me that, you know, 2FA is not necessarily uh, that secure because you can you can basically spoof a SIM card. Uh, so if you're aware of that, that's not necessarily accurate. It's extremely difficult to spoof a SIM card uh, to get that secondary code these days. Verizon, AT&T, all the big carriers have made it a lot more difficult to facilitate getting a SIM card with an organization. There's a process, there's typically a password that's leveraged. So they're making their strides to make it more secure in this space as well, which is definitely what we need. Next slide, please. Next Gen Antivirus Managed Threat Response is what MTR stands for. You're gonna to start to see every single health insurance organization starting next year to get renewed, I've already started to see it since June of this year, they will not renew insurance or cybersecurity insurance for organizations unless you have some type of next-gen antivirus that has managed, managed threat response. And what MTR means is basically you're replacing your old antivirus product with another antivirus product that has different feature sets associated in it that addresses specifically ransomware uh, the crypto locker and all the different flavors of crypto, as well as it, it ties into a back-end network operating center that is constantly checking for abnormal behavior, meaning if, if Michael never logs in at 2 a.m. in the morning or that specific device he uses never logs in at 2 a.m. in the morning and it, it does uh, on, an, on an odd evening or an odd morning, um, it's going to create a ticket and depending, and it's gonna watch the behavior on that device. And if it is malicious, it's gonna kick that, that device completely off the network. And it's gonna do it from the back end knock uh, that I just referenced. They're constantly watching, constantly looking for this type of behavior. And the software is actually coded in a means where if crypto starts to kick off, um, it'll stop it at that device before it goes and spreads to other devices or to your file systems or your patient data. So that doesn't get encrypted. That's extremely, probably the most important tool in today's climate, and it gets overlooked because it's not cheap. So you probably don't have a next-gen antivirus installed unless you're paying $15 to $20 a month per device. And I think I have that conversation like, oh, we think our, we think our product does that. And I'm like, well, how much are you paying for it? Four or $5 a device? I'm like, that's not it. So 
to get that knock, to get that MTR, the, the, the least amount, I mean, even with CrowdStrike, some of these great platforms out there, Sentinel One, um, their entry point for MTR is right around 15 to $17 a month to get that feature set. So it's well worth it. I've installed it in abundance in the last year, and it's pretty impressive, these platforms. Uh, Sophos is another fantastic product that addresses crypto. Sentinel One, Trend Micro has a great product. CrowdStrike has a great product. There's what's called uh, Falcon. Uh, and that, I think that's around $18 a seat, but that is extremely as baked in intelligence that catches again this odd behavior and it will not allow software like keyloggers, MCATs, or any malicious hacking tools that they use and we constantly are scanning for to, to remove from the networks that we uh, engage with. Next slide, please. Commercial grade firewall. So most healthcare organizations that are your hospital systems, they definitely have very good sound firewalls that are built for redundancy. But a lot of the smaller base systems, your two to three, your clinics, your, thing, your, your smaller organizations, I'm always shocked to walk in there and find a firewall appliance that you can buy off Amazon, you can buy at Best Buy, um, those types of devices, typically, they typically do not have some of the feature sets outlined in this slide that are extremely important. I won't go into great detail, but some of the, the things that are required in this, this is the most important device in your whole network. It's the gateway. It's what lets people in and out. Um, it's the bouncer of your network, so to speak. It needs to have intrusion protection service, which is constantly scanning for threats and weird packets that are coming inbound and outbound of that particular device it's going to alert you when weird activities when you get a lot of login requests externally like gene said earlier a lot of work is being done remotely these days obviously this particular device is going to capture all that traffic and and catch that weird activity at that gateway appliance before it even touches any of your systems so having the right kind of product set up and configured properly are going to stop a lot of these mis mishaps before even happening so Geofencing is also a great feature. If you know all your clients are in certain regions of the world, lock it down to that. Lock out other bad areas of the world where most hackers are coming in. Unless you have patience and work that is going to be done from those areas, be proactive. Lock those users down so they can't even ping you from those geographical areas. Uh, deep packet inspection, web filtering is also a huge uh, deliverable that, that typically gets overlooked uh, in terms of severity level. I, I lock down absolutely everything and then allow access. So I'm more of lock everything down and then provide access, work with the organization, find out what sites that they actually need to go to uh, because most people are coming in from easily users just browsing the internet and going to sites that they shouldn't go to, unfortunately. Next slide, please. Correct spam service. So again, most crypto comes in through email, unfortunately. So having the correct spam service that is doing features like silver listing, um, it, it's a, which is basically a handshake with your email server saying, are you a legitimate source? That cuts down on a lot of malicious attempts. Um, and a lot of spam filters don't facilitate this feature set. So there's a lot of great products wrapped around spam services. And I have them listed here below, Mimecast, Sophos, Barracuda, ProPoint, Cisco. These are all great products that do this feature set. It also, they also have their brand of what I call target threat protection. And what that does is it basically, any links that come within an email and even images that if you click, they have a hyperlink associated. Every single link within an email is opened at one of these services first, kind of in a sandbox environment to validate that it's a, a good link and it has no malicious content. And then it'll open up in your browser, whatever browser you may be leveraging. But that's going to cut down on a lot of malicious attempts. This is typically not installed because, yes, it does to load, to hit a link in an email and to launch on your Explorer. Um, it might take three to four seconds as opposed to one. 
So that's why a lot of organizations don't do it because doctors and admin staff, they don't want to wait that extra two to three seconds. But the value there of waiting two to three seconds and having one of these expert cloud services vet the link first before you open it, the value that there's just so much more value in having that feature set associated and waiting a few seconds in, in my humble view. Uh, it also deals with impersonations, right? So if this is a, a common thing within organizations where the CEO will email someone and it's not him and they spoof his email, these types of services will stop that so that it doesn't even get, so that process doesn't even happen, whether it's an internal email or ex external, it's gonna stop things of that nature. Next slide, please. Point in time backup solution. So this is why this is, you know, in the last two years, we've, we've got a lot of media attention wrapped around crypto and ransomware. Um, the reason why is because these healthcare organizations didn't have viable backup solutions. It wasn't because they wanted to track down the patient data that was stolen because that data is gone. It's in the dark web. I can go to a website on the dark web right now and buy patient data if I was so inclined. That's not why it got so much media attention. It got media attention because obviously the organizations were being held for ransom, but they also didn't have viable backups and their backups weren't segregated. So backups and the NTR having the right vulnerability software, AV on your system, these are the two most important things if you had to pick two out of everything discussed today that I've discussed today, they're the most important attributes in my humble view. So point in time basically means that if, if ransomware happened 10 hours ago and it only affected a certain portion within the network and the IT got notice of it this hour, they can literally go to 11 hours ago and restore all that data back down within two to four hours. And any backup system should be set up and architected in a means where you could push down 60 to 70% of your data in two to four hours. And if your backup system can't facilitate that restore timeline and process, it's not the right backup solution. And that should be entertained and rebuilt, uh, especially in today's climate. So point in time basically means you're just not backing up once a day, which is, you know, most healthcare systems do twice a day, but I recommend every three hours, four hours, you, you take a snapshot of all your, your patient data, all critical data, so that you're minimizing your gap of, of, of loss of data or encrypted data for that matter. Even if you do all these things, you can still get ransomware. So you have to plan for the worst. And the one thing that they can't touch is your backup. If you segregate it off your production environment, which it should be via best practice. So even if you get crypto, it's not touching your backup data. In tandem to that, your on-premise backup data repository should also replicate off-site, which if, any, if everyone's following HIPAA, that's already being set up. Your backup data is off-site, but it's extremely important. And this typically gets overlooked Typically, that backup system has direct access to that third-party site that's replicating the data. That is a big no-no. So the on-site system should have no conduit, no RDP on the desktop that'll bounce over to the server at the third-party site. It needs to be in its own separate network over there that's segregated. So you have to treat it for worst-case scenario, and that's how we're building systems now. We're segregating backup platforms whether it's in the cloud, uh, whether it's at a secondary location, it's all segregated. Uh, there's a lot of great products that will facilitate everything that I just discussed here. Uh, Quest has a great product called Rapid Recovery. Veeam is a fantastic product. Commvault's a fantastic product. Between these five, I'd probably lead more with your Veeam or Commvault. They're fantastic products that will achieve everything discussed. Next slide, please. Vulnerability scans. Um, so, you know, Gene mentioned it's, it's extremely important to work with an IT organization that can help you maybe not manage your IT, but at least come in periodically to do vulnerability scans and tell and work with your IT department to specify, hey, I, we found these 15 vulnerabilities, you need to counteract those. Now, obviously, there's a cost associated. so. There's a narrative and, a, and an ROI that needs to be presented to C-level folks, but that should, be, that should be done every single quarter, in my opinion, uh, as well as user training. There's a lot of great products out there. Sophos has some, Cisco has some, where you can send emails to your staff that are basically phishing 
or crypto like emails, but they're fake. But it's such a well done system where if Gene opens it, not only is IT management going to know about it, they're also going to send Gene a video of what to do and what not to do and what she did. And next time do it this way. And it's all virtual training. They have to take a little course and everyone signs off on it. These are the preventative natures that you're going to start to see HIPAA push. They're going to start to say you have to do these training activities because because systems just aren't locked down the way uh, the way they should be, unfortunately. Uh, and I think HIPAA and OCR are aware of that. So they're 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 going to do multi prong approach from a technology perspective so that they can cover their bases. So again, find an IT firm or find the right kind of software. There's a lot of great softwares out there. We use Rapid Fire. Um, and get your internal IT department and get an executive sponsor there to run these types of, of activities and to um, true up these vulnerabilities. Because the vulnerabilities that you fixed six months ago, there's more of them six months later. And unless you're constantly on top of it, you can go two years without checking this and all of a sudden you've got a boatload of vulnerabilities. And then your C-level staff are going to be really upset because that cost point to fix it is going to be substantially higher than if you do it over a six-month period, every six months. So um, next slide, please. And so basically that, that's, the, that's everything that I want to talk about today regarding ransomware. And, and I don't know if there's a Q&A session, but we can certainly address any questions from um, the user group. Thank you, David. Um, that was an excellent presentation. Uh, really enjoyed your insights into uh, the current attacks on healthcare and the defensive practices and technology that are needed to best prevent those uh, from succeeding. Um, wanted to say Ben Franklin in the 1700s famously said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And he was reminding people at that time to be vigilant about fire awareness, but it certainly applies uh, still. Uh, it's a lot easier to, to prevent it um, in many cases anyway. Um, so still don't see any questions, but people in the audience, we do have uh, about eight minutes or seven minutes left in the hour. So please feel free to, to chat in or put a question to the Q&A. Um, I have a question uh, for Jean. Um, what are uh, the responsibilities of a business associate when it comes to uh, complying with cybersecurity regulations and risks? Um, so you, you maybe a, a hospital uh, system, you know, contracts out some of their billing or or other work. Um, what what sort of responsibilities do do those contractors have? Business associates are also covered under HIPAA, so they basically have the same um, responsibilities that you as a healthcare entity have. And it's important when you're contracting with your business associates to ensure by periodically, you know, checking that they are um, in compliance as well. Typically um, when there's, you know, it's, if, they, if they are the ones maybe maintaining records and the data breach situation is on their end, um, while it may, let's say maybe they were the tech vendor for your EHR, you, you may end up ultimately, um, notifying your patients, but you can make contractual arrangements to adjust for that, but they will have liability as well. And, you know, there's, uh, I think that one, um, that one case I talked about uh, with Electa, which was the cloud storage company, um, there's actually allegations, I think in that, I think that's the case where the allegation against the medical practices and providers that used that company was that they failed to adequately vet that vendor and they should have vetted them better um, and been able to, you know, but in that way, safeguard their, their patient's data. Um, so you need to be in close contact with your business associates and make sure that they're doing the things they need to do um, but they, they definitely, HIPAA applies to them and there are, you know, business associate type of entities 
that have been investigated by OCR and OCR has issued um, corrective action plans and penalties. Excellent, thank you. Um, let's see, still not seeing any other questions. Um, David, uh, what do you recommend? And uh, if you covered it, I apologize, but what do you recommend uh, that a, an organization do when they um, believe that they may have uh, been compromised in some way? So what should they turn systems off? Should they disconnect from networks? Should they leave it alone and call you? Like, what? how do you approach that situation? Yeah, unfortunately there isn't a, a an easy process there, primarily because if you feel you've been breached, um, you just can't dis disconnect a device or disconnect a user account. For example, two weeks ago, an organization got breached and we got called in. It took a, it took me, it took three guys four days to get them out, just because they use software that's extremely intelligent. It's like a spider web where I can wipe it off. 500 machines, I get all, I get everything off there, and then I, I miss one, and then it replicates it back to everything. So it's, it's like whack-a-mole, unfortunately. So if you feel that you've been breached, um, you need, you, you need to rely on people that have not done this once or twice, someone that's done this a hundred times in the last two years, and they need to come in with their tool sets and knock it out quickly. And, you know, these are tool sets that are, you know, some of these tools that we have, I mean, they're tools that we, that, I mean, my team got off the dark web and some of the teams I've spent a lot of money, a lot, a lot of tools I've spent a lot of money on. Um, so my point being is having your internal IT team try to figure it out. Typically that happens for a month and then they call someone like our organization because they can't get rid of it. And they're so frustrated they just need a second set of eyes. Um, so that's my recommendation is, is there, there's no still, you know, there's no silver bullet of like, you know, disconnect the infected device off the network. Yeah, that, that's obvious, but in 99% of the time, it's already to somewhere else in the network. And in most breaches, they've already been in there for three months and you just don't know it. And then, so, then they decide to do something three months post and then IT becomes aware of it. And then they're then they're shuffling trying to get them out. So, oh, excellent. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Um, well, I don't see any questions yet uh, from the audience, but thank you very much for attending, everyone. Uh, this presentation has been part of the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers webinar series. The next webinar is scheduled for November eighteenth, and will be presented by the Southeast Telehealth Resource Center. Registration and further information will be sent out soon. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we do uh, value your opinion uh, greatly and ask that you take a few minutes and complete the online survey. Um, that will help us to improve our uh, webinars in the future and uh, help, help to address topics that, that are of interest to you. Thank you all very much.